A modern parable that I came across and would like to share with you. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat. But the few devoted them members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time and money and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought, new crews were trained, the little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds, put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now, the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in this club's decorations, and there was a miniature lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick, and some of them had black skin, and some had yellow skin. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where victims of the shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities since they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. They did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along the shore. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. Paul writes in his letter to the church at Colossae that he rejoices in his sufferings. Not because he particularly wants to suffer. If you read in his second letter to the church at Corinth, he cries out to God to remove the thorn from his side. He is evidently no sadist. He, but he does not, so he does not rejoice in his suffering just because he wants his suffering. He rejoices because he says they are for you, the church. If you remember that uh, Paul's letters are all written to a group of people in a church, this is, if you can you imagine being a church and hearing these words written to you? I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake. And in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body that is the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. If you think about this hearing that, hearing someone say, like, I am here, and I am here to suffer for you. He is doing what he understands uh, to matter for the good of the church so that others might know the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And then we read it in his letter to the Timothy, the, uh, Timothy, who was another young leader in the church, and Paul is sort of mentoring Timothy. And, and he commends to him the same approach. It becomes clear that this is not just something that Paul will do. This is something that he expects all the people who follow Jesus to have this understanding uh, of suffering. He writes to Timothy, You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. So as a leader, he's telling you, go find and make other leaders. And he continues, Share in the suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
No one serving in the army gets entangled in everyday affairs, instead aims to please the officer. An athlete is not crowned without competing according to the rules. The farmer who does the work gets the first share of the crops. Think over these things and the Lord will give you understanding. And I think the understanding is clear. Do your work. And if it hurts, that's okay. Do the work. If that's what a soldier does, that's what a farmer does, that's what an athlete does. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, that is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the saved, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ. Paul rejoices in what he is doing because it is worth it. The purpose is being accomplished. What he desires is happening. People are turning and following Jesus and becoming part of this new thing called church. And, and as he does this, he is, he, there are times when he is suffering, but I think it is important to note the way that he suffers. When, when Paul uh, suffers just because it's a hard journey, that's one thing. When he suffers because people attack him, he responds in a distinctive fashion, and we, we need to pay attention to it. When Paul is chased out of town, uh, he's chased out of Iconium, like he is just like chased out of town. Uh, 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 there's like a lynch mob forms, and he has to leave Iconium or else he will be killed. He doesn't go one town over and raise his own mob and attack back. He just keeps on going. Right? When Paul is attacked at Galatia, he, he starts a church at Galatia and he moves on, and then some other people show up and attempt to take over the church. He doesn't write a letter back saying it is time to have like an armed resistance to attack those people who took over my church. Right? He gets angry. It, Galatians is a very angry letter. But he does not demand anyone suffer for that. Right? When Paul is jailed in Rome, he does not seek to hurt his guards. Instead, he gets along with them so that he might tell them about who Jesus is. What Paul is doing is he is suffering, sometimes at the hands of others, and he will take a hit without hurting others in return. And if you think about how hard that is to get hit and not hit back, it's not an easy thing. This is what Paul is practicing, suffering for what he loves, suffering for Jesus. And this is what he commends to Timothy, suffer for what is worth it, and then don't hit back. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says, turn the other cheek. Anyone here ever struggle with the idea of turning the other cheek? All right, this is what Jesus says, do, when someone hits you, don't hit him back, turn the other cheek. We need to spend a minute to, to actually show you what that looks like, because it's not what you think it is. So I need a volunteer. I need someone to come up here so I can hit him. It won't hurt. Oh, come on. Josh, come on up. So, some things have changed dramatically socially over the last 2,000 years. This, there's one thing that really hasn't. If I want to demean another person and we're facing each other head on, the way that you put, some, put someone in their place is you slap them, right? It's the most demeaning way to hit someone. So if I slap you, just stay like there for a second, right? That is the most demeaning thing I can do. Now, you ha at this point can either hit me back, you can run, or you can turn, turn the other cheek, and you, now, can I slap you again? <laughs> no, because the backhanded slap, I can't slap you again, because if you turn the other cheek and I slap you, I'm going to hit your schnoz, and that's awkward and weird. And so if you turn the other cheek, how do I have to hit you? I can't hit you with the back of my hand anymore, I have to hit you with a closed fist. And, and the, the, so the way it worked was you slap an inferior, you punch an equal. You can sit down. That wouldn't hurt too much. Touch awkward, but thanks for enduring it. That is how turning the other cheek works. To turn the other cheek is not to roll over and say, you'll just do what you want to me. Right? To turn, because there's this, this thing, I, I can slap you and, and then demean you, but you're, and you don't hit me back, but you don't just kind of roll over and play dead. You stand up, you turn the other cheek, and now you're forcing me to address you as an equal. It's actually fairly aggressive. I'm not going to hit you, 
but you're not going to treat me as lower than you anymore. It's an amazing thing. This is uh, what Jesus, if you look at how, like, how Jesus lives, we look at how Paul suffers, this is what uh, they actually, we actually see. Jesus turned the other cheek, right? He would take a hit. People could hurt him. He wouldn't hurt them back. Did it mean that he was going to like stop and stop preaching and stop healing and stop doing what he believed in? No. You can hit him fine. He's going to still do his thing. That's what turning the other cheek really looks like. You stand up for what you believe for, and you keep on marching. You keep on doing what you believe in. Right? If you think about how that can change a situation, because well, let's take an example. On March 7th, 1965, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. leads a march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in what now we call Bloody Sunday. He is marching, why is he marching? He's marching with a group of people for civil rights, for the ability to vote. Right? He's doing this out of love of neighbor. He's doing this as a follower of Jesus. And everything Martin Luther King Jr. did, he did because he followed Jesus. And he is marching with these fellow Christians who want to march for the right to vote because this is a way to love their neighbor. And they're marching across the bridge. And you remember what happened next, right? The uh, dogs were released on them and they were attacked. Think about the options at that moment. They have three options. Martin Luther King Jr. And, and those following him could have said, okay, you got me. You've hit me. I'm done. I roll over. I'm going to go home and never bring it up again. Is that what happened? No. Kept on marching. What they could have done is pulled out guns and shot back. What would have happened in 1965 if a group of black Americans shot a group of white cops? How would that have gone down? Just, just think about that. That would have been a touch ugly. What did happen? Martin Luther King Jr., they collectively turned the other cheek. You can hit me, but you're not going to treat me as lesser. I'm going to keep on marching. Here we go. And if you t take a swing at me again, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn the other cheek. I'm not going to hurt you back. I'm going to keep on marching. Because that's what we're going to do. That's what we believe in. This is, it was transformative, right? Turning the other cheek changed this country. This is what we see in Jesus, and this is what we then see in Paul. The love for another, doing what we believe in, which at times leads to suffering, and to absorb suffering without hitting back. An act of forgiveness like this creates possibilities where there were not possibilities before. It's what happens on the cross. Like Jesus is dying as a result of sin, and Jesus does not call down the armies of angels to kill all of those who have attacked him. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. Creates this opportunity for us to learn what we do, to accept forgiveness and to change. And if you think about it, we do it naturally with one group of people, our children. How often do you hurt? Are you hurt by your children when they're growing up? Right? And do you ever look at them and say, that's it? I don't care if you're seven. You're out of here. You no longer have a home to live in. Right? Good luck. Off you go. No. You turn the other cheek. Your child hurts you. You turn the other cheek and say, don't do that again. You don't like roll over and say, do whatever you want. You stand for what you believe in. Don't do that again. And then they have the opportunity to grow and to learn and to grow up. Right? To turn the other cheek is to treat other people with the same love that we have for our children. You stand for what you believe in. You don't hit them back. And you give other, other people the opportunity to grow. It opens the door for new possibilities. And it lets go of a cycle of violence approach. Because the temptation is, you hurt me and I hurt you. Then you hurt me and I hurt you, right? You, you ever have someone get... That temptation to get even, right? Someone hurts me and I need to get even. Have you ever seen it happen where like two people are hurting each other? Like you hurt me, so I've got to hurt you to get even. Where one of the person says, okay, let me do some math. Okay, we're even. Like we can stop hurting each other. Has anyone ever said that? You're right, we're even now. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? Like this doesn't happen. It takes one person taking the hit and saying, I'm not going to hit you anymore. I'm going to turn the other cheek. 
I think part of the challenge of doing this, especially doing it in, in groups, turning the other cheek, is a deep uneasiness about asking other people to suffer for what we believe in. Like, I'll suffer for what I believe because it's my belief. To ask you to stand up and suffer with me, that, ooh, right, that gets dicey. At what point are we willing to have our friends, our church, our family, our children suffer for what we believe? Like, I'll turn my, I'll turn my cheek. Can I ask you to do that with me? That, that gets uneasy, right? As I read the story of the life-saving station, that is what I, I sort of see is, uh, as they go through this sort of purpose drift. They go from a, a, a group of people profoundly committed to going out and um, working and suffering for something that is worthwhile, and to, they got comfortable. Think about, and they go from this, this at, at first, a group of people that would, they would go out, and you, can you imagine the, the satisfaction that there would be three or four guys, three or four people who have gotten a boat, go out and they come back and they're wet and they're cold and they're exhausted, but they have saved someone, right? That suffering for a purpose there. And as that becomes less what that community does, as more people show up and, and we don't say, if you're going to be part of this community, you're going to get in the boat and here we go, right? And then it just becomes, that's, that's the exception and that's just, we're just here to be comfortable and the idea of getting cold and wet seems less and less appealing, right? Especially, I mean, and, but the pressure is like, that's not what nice people do, that's not what regular people do, why are we doing that? It, it's not socially acceptable. Like then, then we get a pushback and then we just end up as a group of people who are comfortable and that's a shame because I think that's the risk of any group of people and I think that's the risk for churches as well because what makes a difference in the world one person being willing to suffer for their beliefs can make a difference but it's so hard what truly makes a difference is a group of people and that's what Paul is modeling for us well, that's Paul, what Paul is inviting the people in the churches he founds to do he is founding them to have a willingness to endure awkwardness and to suffer for what is worthwhile and to invite others to do the same keeping in mind the purpose that makes it worth it that we are following our Lord and Savior Jesus and that any to follow Jesus's dream is satisfying in a way that that's just worthwhile right and if you think about what Paul does in the beginning, uh, as he begins these churches, you think of how he, he shapes the churches. Like, Paul could have begun a church for the Jews and a church for the non-Jews, and it would have been a lot easier. Right? To say everyone is welcome at church is easy, but, but imagine, like, imagine what happens at the first fellowship meal. You have people coming to the table, and the non-Jewish people bring a big old pork loin, and the Jewish people walk up to the table and look at that pork loin and go, ah! Right? Because they've never touched pork in their lives. You think that that would be an awkward moment. You think about like the, the first time a, a non-Christian, a non-Jewish set of Christians bring their newborn child and say, hey, look, little Timmy. And then the, the Jewish Christians show up and say, oh, Timmy, sweet, when's the circumcision? You want to do what? Right? That would be slightly awkward. <laughs> it would have been a lot easier for Paul to say, you, you, you two are too different. You just go in your separate corners and you just have your own church. And instead of what Paul said was, we're one church. And it's going to be awkward and it's going to be weird and it's going to be uncomfortable. Suck it up, buttercup. You're doing this for Jesus. I'm not sure that's a precise translation from the Greek, but I think you get the point. Right? <laughs> When we say that all people are welcome, we are doing what Paul said to do, right? Inviting all people to this table. And when, all, and when everyone really does show up, whoo, baby, does that get awkward at times. But it's, it's what we are called to do. It's worth it. And, and let's just be honest for a moment. People aren't going to show up at this table unless we invite them. And we've we, we got to look at who, who do we invite to church, right? Everyone's welcome at church, but who do we actually invite to church? It continues with looking not just at who is in the church, but think about who the church serves. Why do we have hospitals today? Like if you go back in history, why do hospitals exist? Part of it is in the term uh, patient. If you go to a hospital today, you, uh, you are called a patient. Why are you called a patient? Because you are expected to be patient. Right? And that's not just because modern hospitals hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait, everything takes Forever. That goes back to the beginning of hospitals. In the beginning of hospitals, centuries ago, 
you didn't go to a hospital uh, to be cured. You went to a hospital because you had nowhere else to go. Like what happened, if you think about centuries ago, if you were sick, who would take care of you? Your family. Who would go to a hospital? People whose family would not take them. Okay, who will take the people that no one else will take? Christians. Christians ran the first hospitals. They took the people that no one else would take to give them a place so they could be patient and well, before they die. Because like modern medicine is still centuries off and so you go to the hospital, you're gonna die and Christians believe no one should ever die alone, ever. All right. So hospitals begin with Christians being willing to serve the people that are the most outcast in society. All right? You, was it awkward? Do you think they caught some flack for that? Yep. They did it anyways. Because it's worth it to follow Jesus Christ and to offer that gospel. We receive an invitation as Paul follows Jesus, as he then invites Timothy to do the same. We are invited to be people who do what matters, to do what is worth it. And when someone strikes us for it, when we catch flack for it, to turn the other cheek and to keep on standing for what we believe and to do so together. To, and, when that mean, and that means inviting everyone to our table. And when we mean everyone, we mean everyone. And to serve anyone who needs it. And when we say anyone, we, need, we mean everyone, anyone, all right? And to do so together. I can go out to serve someone by myself, but if I'm going to make a difference, I need, you, I need you to go with me, and you need me to go with you, right? We need to do this together. We do it together, and we can make a difference, but that, what that means is that we have to be willing to turn the other cheek together. We need to be willing to suffer together. We need to be committed to following Jesus together to be so inspired by the dream of the kingdom of God that we will do what it takes. And when that means that we end up tired, wet, and cold together because we've gone out into lifeboats, well, we've done it. And we'll know that it was, been, it was worth it because we have saved lives and we have given people good news. And I, then I hope we can smile in satisfaction and joy at having done what Jesus calls us. Amen. I invite you to stand and join with me as we confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed.